called uh, Soul of a Citizen, Citizen Living with Conviction in Challenging Times, has just been reissued. This is a book that has um, a number of uh, several printings, and uh, a lot of people know this book. And this is the, there are copies of this book for sale back here on this table. And, uh, and also uh, copies of his other book, which is called The Impossible Will Take a Little While, A Citizen's Guide to Hope in a Time of Fear. These are wonderful books. Uh, Paul has spent over 30 years researching and, and also acting as a social activist, as a, but encouraging so many other people, especially students. He goes to college campuses a great deal. In encouraging students, and particularly this last election, for instance, he visited many, many campuses and, 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 and uh, in inspired a lot of students to be involved in the electoral process. Um, this is very important at a time when, as we all know, those of us who've been active in social movements, um, it's very difficult not to be cynical or discouraged. And um, Paul has been is one of those people who is who just is, is remains hopeful and inspiring uh, to all of us who who do this, and not to uh, not to give up. He reminds us that so many of the the great movements um, that we are that we look back on now took place over centuries. The the, the anti-slavery movement, the the movement for women's suffrage in this country in this country and a variety of other things that uh, that we now uh, th think of as triumph but th most of the people who worked in those those movements uh, did not see the fruit of their labors during their lifetime and if you're going to be a, a citizen and an activist citizen you have to live with a great deal of patience and a great deal of hope and that's what Paul keeps stressing in his books and to his people and he and these books also lift up examples of people who are doing remarkable things and um, so he's going to talk about that tonight uh, I'm also going to uh, mention this Paul writes for other um, for he writes articles for the Huffington Post for instance uh, other magazines and once a month he sends out some of these articles uh, to people on his email list. If you would like to be on one, on this list, I'm I am on that list. I see his articles every month. Uh, you can sign up if you give him your email address on one of these um, sheets. So I'm going to pass these out. If you're interested in that, put your name, your email address. You're not going to be solicited for things, and you just put it on the back table. Uh, there's another another one back there as well. So I'm just going to pass these out. And uh, if you are interested in receiving um, uh, articles uh, from him and, and announcements about where he will be and that sort of thing, you can do that in that way. So, very nice to have you with us, Paul Lowe. Very, very glad to be here. I've actually spoken here once before, and it's been a delight. That was a delight, so I'm, I'm, I was looking forward to this as well. And what I wanted to do is just talk a little bit, and then I'll open it up for questions, uh, about what does it mean to be living in these times? And they're not the easiest times. I mean, you know, it's just, I think maybe, a, uh, whatever, it's 15 months ago, and you know, November of 08, a lot of us had a sort of false hope that it was just, everything was going to be solved. Uh, as, a, as a young woman who uh, actually founded, who I write about, who actually founded for students for Obama on Facebook said, said, people thought that here are these position papers and Obama gets elected and they just become the law and that's the way it is. And of course that's not the way it is. And you know, it's not that way for Obama and it's not that way for, for, you know, for any president, you know, good or bad. And so the question is, what is our role? I mean, how do we as ordinary citizens you know, build on the successes that we've had, build on the progress that's been made, but move forward. And so I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about that. How do we reach out to other people? How do we draw them in? How do we maintain our, our own spirits uh, when, when, you know, when they tend to flag? All of those kinds of questions. And 
And so to me, the, the first thing I think that's, that's important to recognize is that, I mean, some of you have been active a long time, of course, know this, that it's not as if somehow there's this morale, when trying to engage people who, who've not been engaged before, maybe re-engage them, that there's a sort of miraculous threshold for activism. You know, you have to be you know, this eloquent, this confident, this certain, uh, as, as, you know, as eloquent as King and saintly as Gandhi, and on and on and on. I mean, it's just not the way it works. I, I love to tell the story that, that Arun Gandhi actually told, um, Gandhi's grandson, about how when Gandhi's family basically mortgaged everything they had to send him to, college, to law school. And so their jewelry, their land, anything of value. And he gets to a law school, fine. And then he gets up in court, and he is shy. And he is so shy that he stammers. And he stammers, and he stammers, and he literally does not get a single sentence out. I mean, he's literally tongue-tied. And he loses, you know, as one might expect, he loses all of his cases. He's an utter disaster. And they don't know what to do. I mean, what do you do? You know, here's your shining hope. You've invested everything in him. And he's a failure. And he's obviously going to, you know, live a life as a failure. So they don't know what to do. So they send him off to South Africa in the hope that maybe, a, you know, a change of scenery might possibly, you know, change things uh, as we know it does. So I love that story. As soon as, as soon as I heard it, I said, can I repeat it? And everyone said, yeah, of course. And... I like it because what it suggests is that when we're trying to engage people and they say, well, you know, you are so much more knowledgeable than I am, you are so much more experienced, you are so much more confident, you can say, well, all right, maybe that's a little bit true, but, I mean, compared to, you know, if you're shy, compared to Gandhi, no way. <laughs> so so I, th I think it's, it's, you know, it's a good departure point. And it's also worth remembering that we don't know who is going to respond. I mean, and that oftentimes people who uh, may, we may find very unexpected will in fact turn out to, to, to play a powerful role in history. I, there's a young woman I profile in the, the new edition of Soul of a Citizen named um, Angie DeSoto, who was a, was a student of Virginia Tech. And I was talking with her, the reason I was talking with her, you'll, you'll see in a minute. Um, and I asked her one point when she was a freshman in 2004, and I said, were you involved in the election at all? And she got kind of embarrassed, and she said, well, you know, I didn't think who was president had anything to do with my life, so I didn't vote. And then she sort of pauses. And she says, well, actually, we did play a drinking game. We divided into random red teams and blue teams. And when nobody really cared which they were on, when a red state flipped, the red team would chug a beer. And when a blue team, blue state flipped, the blue team would chug a beer. And uh, by the end of the evening, we didn't even know who was running and kind of woke up with a hangover. Some of, us, some of us woke up with a rather different hangover the next morning, uh, despite our best efforts. And so I, I, what I like about that is that was where she started, in her phrase, a drunken party girl. Where she ended up was rather different. She was, was taking a research, resources geology class, and a professor started talking about global climate change. She'd never heard of it. She asked her, her, her mother, her mother never heard of it. Uh, she asked a young woman on her hall, they'd never heard, heard of it. And she was just kind of stunned. She starts reading about it, she starts taking more classes. She gets involved in a very, very modest campus environmental group. That, I mean, modest enough that basically it took her almost a year to find out that it existed on this campus of 25,000 students. And turns out that she's a really gifted organizer. And she volunteers with the PERGs, the Public Interest Research Groups, one of the summers, learns them, and she said, you know, you just learn. You knock on 25 doors, you get 23 rejections, and the last two people say, thank you so much. I would like to get involved in this. And so, you know, it's, it's that sense of being able to, to persist. And she ends up growing that group into the largest group of any kind, and of any student group on that campus. And they approached the administration, which initially had been very sort of, you know, we've got other things to deal with, but started taking them seriously once they gained a sense of numbers and power. And ends up basically, with the support of the college president, pushing through this major campus sustainability project that she now runs, uh, having just graduated from the school. And, and I look at that and I get so much hope from it because it, had she started from the get-go, you know, full-blown activism, I mean, that would have been great, 
But it wouldn't have been, in some level, as hopeful as somebody coming just, you know, absolutely the least likely person, and, and you know, and shifting. And so, so that's the, that's what, that's what inspires me, you know, is, is those sort of unlikely journeys. And you just don't know where people are going to end up. And that, that's true with the, I mean, it's true with the giants of history. I, 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 I write it, I, I open the new version of Soul of a Citizen with the Rosa Parks story that was in there earlier, but I sort of decided to actually lead with it this time. Because what strikes me is that everybody in America thinks they know the name Rosa Parks, and most people around the globe actually do. But they don't actually know the story. And, and it, it came to me, I was on a CNN show in Atlanta, and Parks was on the same show, remote from Detroit where she lived. And I had already had, had, my segment was finished, so I couldn't really say anything. And they started introducing her. And they say, one day, we're so glad to have Rosa Parks on. One day Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus. And that started the civil rights movement. And I'm just like, well, no, it actually, I mean, I can't say anything because I already did my segment. It actually didn't start the civil rights movement because the civil rights movement already existed. In fact, Rosa Parks was already part of it. And she was the secretary of the NAACP and the mentor to their youth section. And you didn't have, I mean, you didn't have the network news camera zooming in saying, all right, folks, you know, this is an important moment. Rosa Parks is making history. She's taking minutes at a meeting where she's calling people to come to an event. Um, that, you know, they, they don't seem to recognize that as part of making history. But in fact, that, those kinds of humble, unappreciated tasks were what builds the groundwork for larger action. You know, in this case, the action after her, her stand on the bus. And so I started thinking about the, you know, the CNN version of history, which, you know, certainly better than God help us, the Glenn Beck version of history, which, you know, might as well be on a different planet. But a rather hostile one, I should say. Um, but at the same time, this version of history is sort of stripped away. What does it mean? Is this uh, lone activist in isolation? Well, that's not how things work. People, they act in a community, always, with other people. I mean, in Parks' case, it was through the vehicle, the NAACP, and there were other people. There was a guy named Edie Nixon who was a union activist. Uh, he was the brother of Sleeping Car Porters Union, and he was the person who got a young and reluctant Martin Luther King involved. And King basically said, when he tried to get him involved, said, look, I'm new here. I think he was 26 years old. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, people don't really know me. Uh, I, somebody who's more experienced, who's more familiar. This was precisely the reason, besides seeing some gifts in him, that Nixon did, in fact, go after King, because everybody else had their sort of, their own turf, and, and if one person came in and led, then the other person would be offended. So, so that was part of why Nixon picked King to begin with. And he also, I think, saw something. And of course, it was, it was, Montgomery was a stage where King became a national and later international, quite shortly, international figure. So what happens? Basically, you have an image of Parks as a lone activist, and you have a reality of her being part of this community that she herself had, had worked to build. It doesn't take anything away from her courage. It just says this is how people act. You have an image of unconscious action. The, the phrase was, her feet hurt. You know, you heard that, you know, her, her feet hurt. And yeah, well, her feet probably did hurt that day and many other days, but she'd also taken training sessions at Highlander Center, this labor and civil rights center in Tennessee, and she'd strategized with an earlier generation of civil rights activists who would be mentors, a woman named Septima Clark in particular, who'd be mentors to her and to King and to the old generation coming along. And so when she acted, I mean, I, I use the phrase, Jim Wallace of Sojourners uses this great phrase. He says, hope is believing in spite of the evidence and then watching the evidence change, you know, by our actions. Great, great image, because you've got to have that leap of faith. At the same time, though, you have to have the practicalities. You know, you have to have figuring out who are your allies, who are your obstacles, how do you tell your story, how do you build power, all those very practical things. And so when Parks took her stand, it was not with foreknowledge of what would happen. I mean, there's no way that she could have anticipated that. But it was knowing that it was about to launch a campaign. And that campaign might succeed, or it might fail, or it might win some things and not win others. But, but she knew it was, a, it was a strategic conscious action. It wasn't accidental. And that's really important, because if we, or others, wait for sort of accidental creation of history, it simply does not happen. And so, so that's part of the story that gets buried. 
And then, of course, just the persistence. I mean, it is 12 years from the first NAACP meeting to the stand on the bus. And so if Parks gives up in three or five or 10, she, we never hear of her. So I think that those are lessons that most people do not know. I mean, I can go to a college and I will tell those stories. And then I will say, okay, I want a show of hands how many people before you either read you know, in my books or heard me speak, how many knew the real Rosa Parks story? Two hands will go up out of 100 you know, or 200. I mean, it's a fraction of it. You know, so, so we're basically, we're not teaching the history. That's true even before like the you know, god-awful Texas school board gets a, you know, gets a hold of it and you know, kicks out Thomas Jefferson for a, a theologian, John Calvin, who believes that if you're rich, you deserve it, and if you're poor, you deserve that. Um, you know, that's, that's even before then. Um, so I think part of the challenge is that you want to be able to say to people who are just getting involved, you do not need to know everything. I mean, they really don't. You really can learn as you go. But you can proceed, and when you do proceed, work with others. And consciously try and figure out, well, okay, what's the best approach? And if it doesn't work, you try something else. And then you try something else. I mean, that's how history changes. And so that's what most people don't know. I mean, I remember asking a student, I said, well, what do we learn anyway in the high schools about social change? He says, you know, we learn the conclusions. We do not know the process. We don't know how change occurs. We learned that Lincoln freed the slaves and women got the vote and some unions were organized and Martin Luther King said, I have a dream and we, somebody signed a civil rights bill. That's about all we know. We do not know anything beyond that. And so if we knew more, he said, we could actually feel more powerful. I would argue, I mean, it's not only, and I'll, I'll circle back on this, it's not only the, all, the, all the young men and women who were involved <coughs> in the Obama campaign who sort of dropped off in the period since, but Certainly one of the things that's true is that I think most of them don't know that those lessons, don't have that larger context, and it makes it harder to, it makes it harder to get, keep going. So that's important. Now, one of the things that I find hopeful is that when you get people involved, you do not know where they are going to end up. And, and, and that's, that can be very powerful if, if we think of it in the right context. So, what, what got me thinking about this was reading um, Vlasov Havel, the former Czech dissident who became their president. Havel described a moment where they were circulating a petition to free some political prisoners. And he himself was in and out of jail um, once for four years. And everybody was mocking them. They were saying, this is not going to make any difference. You're, you know, you're just trying to get attention. Well, yes, they were trying to get attention. And, uh, but for the cause, and you know, maybe you should quietly help behind the scenes. And you know, this, this is futile. Even people who are hostile to the, to the regime, people like Milan Kundera was the best known literary figure in Czechoslovakia and was safely in exile in Paris. So it wasn't as if he would be in jail. But he really mocked him in one of his books. And Havel looked back about seven years later. So this is before, this is three years before 1989. This is three years before Czechoslovakia has the Velvet Revolution and the Berlin Wall falls. And, and you know, basically those dictatorships crumble all over Eastern Europe. So he's, he's writing under dictatorship, but he says, you know, we, looking back on this moment, he says, we actually tried to free these prisoners and we did not succeed. So some, you know, so maybe the, the critics are right that, that it was just all futile. He said, but I do not think that's true. One reason, um, they were very courageous people and we needed them. And because they knew that there were people out there fighting for them, that allowed them to, to keep on going. So that, you know, breaking the isolation is the same way as Mandela and his compatriots in um, South Africa. You know, they're in Robben Island prison and they're told they're gonna basically rot and die there. And yet they're always finding ways to act. So they're denied newspapers and a guard is, wraps his tuna fish sandwich in a, in a newspaper discards it in the trash and they kind of smuggle it under their shirts and, and in a coded script on a piece of toilet paper, pass a story or a headline cell to cell just to keep each other's spirits going. So it's a sense of, of not knowing that you're, you know, you're alone. I mean, probably, you know, in New York City, less of a problem, but in much, you know, some of the country, in you know, heart of red America, you know, it is a problem. You do feel isolated. And so what happens is that the petition helped give people that sense of others being out there of solidarity 
and they keep on getting, they keep on involved. Now, the other thing he did, he said, is the people who stood up and spoke out, that was their first step. It was not their last step. He said they went on to play dissident music, put on dissident plays, uh, preach from the pulpit, speak out in the schools, just challenge the regime in a hundred different ways. And he said, there's so many now, they can't throw us in jail. And I started thinking about that after I read that, because it was a losing effort in the sense that, um, that the petition didn't free the prisoners. And yet, had they not undertaken that losing effort, three years later, they wouldn't have overthrown the dictatorship. So, so what, what that suggests is that you can get people involved and you don't know where they are going to end up, even if the, your initial efforts fail. It's true, true of Rosa Parks. I mean, we know that, if you ask how she got involved, we know that her husband, Raymond Parks, was a co-founder of the NAACP <laughs> in Montgomery. He was a barber. And so one of the ways that she got involved is when they got together, he'd already been involved, and so that made it very easy. Then, I mean, at least easier. The question is, how did Raymond Parks get involved? It's not something that I've seen written about. I mean, you have to assume that there are these conversations, and somewhere, you know, maybe in a barber shop, somebody said, you know, we've got to be able to take these issues on, and they weighed the costs, which were very real, because you could end up hung by a tree. They're taking on issues like lynching, so, you know, you could end up dead yourself. Some did. It was not a costless or a risk free endeavor. But what I would argue is that if not for those anonymous people who got Raymond Parks involved, maybe you don't have Rosa Parks involved. If you don't have Rosa Parks involved, you don't have that stand on the bus, although there were other people who refused to move the back of the bus in their youth section. So, so what I'm suggesting is that there are always these streams of influence, and you just never know where they're going to end up. O Obama's an example. Most people, I mean, it's sort of depressing to me that when I ask most people where they think he got his political start, everyone says Chicago. And, I mean, in some level, that was a major part of his engagement. But in fact, his initial involvement was with the um, anti-apartheid movement of the um, 70s and 80s. And what happened is there was, uh, people don't, don't recall, essentially all over one of the things that South Africa was at, Freedom Movement was asking people to do is to put pressure on companies to pull out of South Africa. And it actually did work. Uh, Desmond Tutu said to some students who were involved at Columbia, I want to thank you and American students. We might not have our freedom without you. It was very pivotal. And at one, at one of the many, many places this occurred was a college, a small college called Occidental in Los Angeles. <coughs> and a guy returned um, from a Green Beret, actually, named Gary Chapman, came back from Vietnam disillusioned with the war and went to community college, transferred to Occidental, and started a campus group. And that group succeeded enough in the sense that they got a faculty and student senate resolution to pull out and divest, and did not succeed in the sense that the trustees said, well, you know, too bad, we don't care. Some of them were involved in the same kinds of companies, so, you know, they were not going to, it was going to take more than that to move them. And he graduates. So you could say, a failure, obviously. You know, you tried and you failed. Except, what happens? Some other people continue on, continue the group, and a young man named Barack Obama comes over from Hawaii as a freshman, gets involved in it, and gives later on a, at one of the trust, in front of one of the trustees meeting, what he later looks back on as a pivotal speech in his life. And that whole experience propels him into social involvement. And so what is interesting to me, I mean, whether one you know, has differences or criticisms of Obama is irrelevant, is that here you are at this point where somebody gets involved and then they go on to change history. And that have people, other people not gotten involved, that whole chain may never happen. And I've, I've, you know, again and again and again, I mean, I remember Wangari Maathai, the Nobel Peace Prize winner from Kenya, describing, as she was speaking in Seattle, I went to hear her, and um, being in this small Catholic college in, in the middle of Kansas, this tiny, tiny town, and talking about the social justice conversations there. And she said, you know, and then I, I just started thinking about a wider world, and then I went back and started the Green Belt Movement, where she's planting trees and came in conflict with the dictatorship, and, you know, down the line ends up in and out of prison and also winning the Nobel Peace Prize. So you look at that, 
and again, you see these chains of influence. And, and I would argue that if, in fact, we're bringing people into involvement, that even if we don't initially achieve our goals, we're doing something very powerful, as long as we're enlarging the circle. Now, there are some other ways to enlarge the circle. I mean, one of the ways is to reach out and somehow find alliances with people who, on many issues you disagree with and will continue to disagree with, but where you can find some common ground. And the example that I, uh, that I write about in Soul of a Citizen is kind of an unlikely one where, um, I don't know if people know about um, internet neutrality, which is I mean, it's in the news because there was kind of a noxious court decision, which isn't going to doom it if the FCC acts in the right way, but just makes it, adds a few more hurdles to go through. And basically what it is, is it's treating the internet as an open commons where everybody gets treated equally <coughs> instead of the private property of Verizon and Comcast and ATT to do things like ATT deciding when Eddie Vedder, the singer of Pearl Jam, was, was, I think it was a performance of his, and he started talking about Bush to like, okay, we cut off the sound. You, know, you, don't get to hear, you don't get to hear what he says about Bush. Or when uh, it was either Narrow or Planned Parenthood, I think it was Narrow, sends out an alert, a text alert with Verizon. Verizon decides not to, not to simply disseminate the text alert. And it's like, sorry, no, that's not the rules. It's like somebody having, it's like the telephone company, the same one, having the right to say, well, these kinds of speeches are okay, but if you talk about these subjects on the phone, your lines will go dead. Um, very, very, given the role of the internet in social activism, absolutely critical. So what happens is Bush's FCC essentially says, oh, well, that's fine for it to be bought and sold property because that's, you know, that's what every institution, the Bush administration, you know, did in every sphere of life. And then um, the telecoms managed to basically push a bill through the House to essentially end net neutrality. And so it really does look like it's going to go down. And then a coalition starts emerging to try and, and reverse things, but it's really playing catch up. There's a group called freepress.net that's a very good group that sort of takes the lead in organizing it, but it's still playing catch up. Until what happens is this, is that there is a series of retreats that brought together people across political lines. And that was, was, that was his conscious goal. It was created by this former Republican congressional candidate uh, named Joe McCormick. And I went to one of them. It was really interesting. I mean, you're sitting there with people who, you know, are sort of, <coughs> on the one hand, people who might be politically sympathetic, people from, in my case, you know, Code Pink and Common Cause and a bunch of other good groups. And then you're sitting there with people like Grover Norquist, who was one of these major Republican strategists who had meetings in his K Street offices to plan strategy. I mean, he is an architect of the Bush administration policies and, and an architect and executor of them in some ways. And you're discovering that actually, personally, he's really kind of a nice guy. It's sort of, you know, it's disconcerting. And one of the stories actually didn't emerge at the conference. I read it someplace, but his, um, when he was growing up, his father would give him ice cream and his other siblings. And then take, and here's your ice cream, and then takes this big scoop out of it and says, and here's your federal tax, and he did. <laughs> and takes another big scoop, and here's your state tax, and he did. And, you know, takes another scoop out, you know, and here's your city tax, not much left. When I just sort of, I came to the conclusion that had I been raised like that, I might have ended up like Grover Norquist, God forbid. So, you know, it gives you a little bit more, I don't know what, humility, you know, some common ground. And, and through one of those meetings, the co-founder of MoveOn.org, um, Joan Blades, met the First the president and then her daughter was the communications director of the Christian Coalition, very conservative, I mean sort of the organization that exemplified the religious right, although it's probably been superseded by focus on the family at this point. And discovered that they, again, same process, they liked each other, they were both moms. So they're talking, they're talking about their kids. They're kind of following up after the meetings and just, you know, how are you doing and what's going on and, and just friends, <coughs> unlikely friends. And then the net neutrality fight starts happening. And Joan starts thinking, she says, well, supposing, calls the Christian Coalition woman, supposing that both of our organizations got involved in this, because we're on different sides of almost every issue, but we both have a common stake in citizen involvement. And the Christian Coalition woman said, yeah, let's do it. And they had a joint press conference with a million they delivered a million signatures, and they had a full-page New York Times ad that began, 
it was, I can't remember which one organization was first, but I think it was, you know, the Christian Coalition and Move On respectively agree that. Well, you know, those phrases respectively agree with those two organizations doesn't happen very much. So you look at that and you think, okay, very interesting. And then they did these joint op-eds and, and Christian Coalition did a joint op-ed with the head of, I think it was, again, it was either NARAL or Planned Parenthood. You know, they're arch enemies because uh, you know, they were defined by abortion politics in a lot of ways. And lo and behold, it stopped, it, it was going to pass the Senate, it stopped in its tracks. And that bought time for the 06 elections and the Senate changed. And then uh, Obama's ran as a strong net neutrality supporter, has appointed FCC commissioners who are strong supporters, and then, you know, and again, there were some obstacles thrown in their way the, in, yes, in a court decision yesterday, but they still have the capacity to basically reverse the Bush policies and and essentially, at least for the moment, protect the internet as it's developed. And it wouldn't have happened without that unlikely coalition. The other thing that actually happened out of that, which was kind of interesting, is that the woman from Christian Coalition, at one of the, it was an energy politics retreat with Al Gore and some environmental folks and the heads of major coal and oil companies and stuff. And the coal and oil folks did not get convinced, unfortunately. But uh, the woman from the Christian Coalition decided that Al Gore was actually a pretty decent sort and, and had some sense and got trained by him in his slideshow and initiated a project where they work with the National Wildlife Federation uh, to lobby Congress on alternative energy, which is pretty cool because as she says, when we walk in the door with you know, the Christian Coalition and the National Wildlife Federation, they, can't, they can no longer d dismiss you know, and just say, oh, it's just a bunch of liberals because that's not who we are. So, you know, so I cite that, again, not to say that, you know, on a bunch of issues, I'm not going to be on the other side of the Christian coalition, because I am, but to say that sometimes you can find unexpected common ground. I would argue possibly, and I'm not sure, but I would say even some part of those Tea Partiers, probably the 17% who voted for Obama, I mean, that's the slice, we know who they are, which slice it is, but, you know, but some of them, if we reach out to them, and say, well, you know, you don't like the Wall, Wall Street, you don't like the banks, well, let's actually put some pressure to get some good, you know, banking regulations in or, you know, or do something like the model of North Dakota State Bank or, I mean, you know, to basically rein in the power of, of just unleashed fi finance capital that's brought us down. And I would argue that, I mean, it may not be the first people you go after, but that some of those people may be receptive. You know, it's, I mean, you just don't know. I mean, another story from the, from the, from the soul of a citizen, my closest friend uh, who I went to school here in New York with, um, named Pete Knudsen, is a commercial fisherman and environmental activist. And at one point, he's done some wonderful work. And at one point, the major industrial interests were essentially trying, because they were so effective, he and his fellow fishermen testifying at things like Endangered Species Act hearings, they tried to put him out of commission by passing a state initiative which had already passed Florida and Texas. So it was, I mean, it was, it was likely to go, and then there was a lot of money behind it. And Pete built this coalition that included, I mean, included the Sierra Club, and it was a pseudo, it was a sort of greenwashing initiative. But the Sierra Club and Audubon and, you know, all the Enviro groups, you know, very quickly came on board and said, no, this is not a pro-environmental initiative, it's an anti-environmental initiative. And the Native American tribes, who originally the fishermen had been very polarized against, but Pete had already built alliances with them, so they come on board very quickly. And then some of the fishermen, this is where it gets interesting, some of the fishermen were members of fundamentalist churches, like Assembly of God, which is John Ashcroft's church. I mean, it's as fundamentalist as you can get. And they started talking to their minister. And you got this Assemblies of God minister giving an invocation against corporate greed on the steps of my state capitol in Olympia, Washington, and sending out a letter to um, all the fellow Every, every Assembly of God church in the state saying that they ought to, you know, um, basically, um, you know, oppose this initiative. And then there was a, uh, it was, I can't remember, it was part of the, one of the, one of the fundamentalist TV networks um, had, had done a sort of, you know, the corporate line on the initiative. And the guy, one of the fishermen goes into him and says, look, you know, do you realize who Jesus' disciples were? They were fishermen. Uh, when Jesus comes back, he's going to rip your head off. <laughs> and, uh, so they, and they had him on. And, you know, uh, so I like that kind of politics because, you, you know, again, it's so easy to get kind of hunkered down with, you know, our own tribe. And, 
<coughs> when we reach beyond it, we don't know what can happen. You know, and, 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 that, and that's a powerful reminder. Um, you know, so, we, so I think that that's something that, you know, again, to me, gives me hope when we, when we can create those kind of alliances. And we never know until, we're try, until we try. Right. Um, you know, so, so, so that, you know, that's part of the challenge. Let me talk about, you know, a couple of other areas. One is just, you know, looking at this particular time. I mean, how do we treat, you know, we, there was a pres presidency that maybe a lot of us ended up working. I, I, I took off a year. Basically, that was what I did. I, I um, wrote a lot of articles and I ran a fi created and ran a 15-state campus election project that got, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know how many thousands of students, but I mean, it got, it got you know, hundreds of campuses that helped get their students involved. And I don't have any regrets about that. I thought it was the right thing to do and, you know, we'd do it again in a minute. But it doesn't mean that, that things are solved when Obama gets in. It means that we have some different possibilities than if we were sitting there right now with some, you know, let's just imagine President McCain and Vice President Palin and what this country would look like. And, you know, yeah, some things are pretty ugly, but boy, I don't even want to think about where things would have gone. You know, and so you have, you know, you have what probably we should have expected, which is, you know, a, mix, a presidency that's good in some things and not so good on others. I mean, you just had a EPA an, um, administrator, Lisa Jackson, who basically pretty much ended this am amazingly destructive process called mountaintop removal, where they blow up mountains and dump them into the valleys. That's huge. I mean, if you live in the Appalachians, that's gigantic. That's not a small victory. You know, did Obama go quite as far as I went on the nuclear stuff? No, but you know, cutting back a third of the arsenals, that's a pretty good, you know, it's a bigger step than we've had in I don't know how long. You know, it's, as Rob Shear wrote, you know, today, it's, it's major, it's significant. And you can argue the health care bill from both sides. From my perspective, um, the fact that 30 million people get coverage is huge that insurance companies can't knock people off the rolls when they get cancer because they had acne 20 years ago is huge. That there aren't, they're no longer, they can't max people out and say, sorry, you've run through your coverage. I mean, I have a brother-in-law who had a heart, chronic heart condition and his company went under. He could not get hired because essentially the plan would have bankrupted because of his heart condition, any small business. Finally got a job with the LA Unified School District, which was large enough that it didn't matter. The, all that ends. You know, on the other hand, could it and should it have been better? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, should it have had some more options for single payer, at least p strong public option? Of course. So how do we view something like that? In my sense is, you say, all right, this is a victory, but I, I use example like the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Act. <laughs> Civil Rights Act was not enough. I mean, Voting Rights Act wasn't enough, didn't solve everything, but you know, but you needed that follow-up major legislation. That's what, you, to me, that, that's what you, you know, you start where you, with what you've won, and then you build further, as opposed to saying, oh, okay, everything's fine, everything's settled, which I don't think is the case. You know, and, and I like, you know, I, I like to think about, I mean, you know, what was the relationship of Kennedy and Johnson to the Civil Rights Movement? I mean, I think personally they were sympathetic, but politically very, very ambivalent. I mean, if you remember the, I mean, a lot, a lot of their time was spent trying to put the brakes on it because they felt like it would be politically damaging. So if you remember, there was a very famous 1964 convention, Democratic convention in Atlantic City, New Jersey, where basically what Johnson was, there was something called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party that had an integrated delegation and wanted to be seated as opposed to the segregated delegation. And Johnson tried to, I mean, he twisted the arm of Martin Luther King, of Walter Ruther of the United Auto Workers, who was a main civil, major civil rights backer, to basically, you know, do not seat these people except for a token two people because it's going to blow the Democratic coalition apart. Now, he wasn't stupid except, well, except with Vietnam, but, um, you know, but in other ways he was a very astute politician and he was right. I mean, it did blow it apart. I mean, and so, so, you know, in the real politics sense, I completely understand what he was doing. It was just simply morally the wrong choice to make. But the important part of it is that people didn't say, oh, okay, well, I guess we're just going to be silent and go home. They kept pushing. And, you know, Johnson ends up putting all his political capital and skill into passing the Civil Rights, passing the Voting Rights Act. And those are very, very important milestones. And so that, to me, it's the model. You know, it's like there's a, African American studies professor at Princeton named Melissa Harris Lacefield, very, very smart. And she's, I heard her at a conference. 
And she showed this slide. This is right after Obama gets in. And it was a slide, a very famous photograph of Lyndon Johnson and Martin Luther King smiling and shaking hands after the Civil Rights Bill is passed. And she said, I've been asking people, which one's Obama? And everybody says, oh, yeah, well, you know, he must be the African-American guy. He must be, you know, Martin Luther King. And she says, no, of course not. He's Lyndon Johnson. He's the president. He cannot be Martin Luther King. That is not his role. He is not the role of a social movement leader. He is the president. Somebody else has to play the Martin Luther King role. And, and you know, when she said Martin Luther King, meaning King and SNCC and the Freedom Riders and SCLC, I mean, you know, everybody. Not just King, of course. And she's right. I mean, you have to have those movements to be able to push even, I mean, I, I think of Obama as a president of pretty goodwill and pretty thoughtful and basically sympathetic, but also temperamentally somewhat cautious, somewhat compromising. So, you know, basically pretty good on the spectrum of U.S. presidents, but, you know, the idea that somehow he'll carry it for us? Of course not. And so, if I look at the last year and a half, or whatever, 15 months, whatever it is, I'm bad on time sequence, since November of 08, what do I see? I see, obviously, the political right out there in force, visibly mobilizing, in some, you know, ugly ways, too. I do not see the counterpart mobilization on the other side. I really don't. What I see are a lot of people clicking and you know, online petitions, letter to the <coughs> senator, all that stuff. It's not, 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 it's certainly worthwhile, I do that. I mean, probably four a day I click on because, you know, they count them, they discount them. I mean, because they know how easy it is to click, but they still count them, so you got, you know, it's worth doing. I mean, it's like flossing or something like that. I mean, you know, you want to do it. But, you know, maybe, you know, maybe less important, you know, I mean, maybe, you know, in the scheme of change compared to flossing in your teeth, it's, you know, maybe it ranks below flossy. I don't know what the, the, the analogy would be in oral hygiene. But essentially, it's a useful thing to do, but it is not the same thing as creating a social movement. And it is not the same thing as that. Which, and it is not, very important, it's not the same thing that people were doing in 08. Because if you remember in 08, what they were doing, and granted, the, you know, it's easier in, in, a, in a political campaign, because it's electoral campaign, because it's very linear. You get this many number of people out, and then you know, if you can get enough out, you win. If you don't, you lose. Uh, and as a time, finite time frame. But what they were doing is they were knocking on doors. They were making phone calls. They were reaching deep, deep economically. Um, you know, that, that helps, too. They were acting in every way they could, and the online organizing it was very important. I mean, when <coughs> Obama spoke, they asked people to said, text in their, their cell phone numbers, and boom, they got this you know, text or email back, and they, <coughs> excuse me, they were encouraged and listed in the database, and given things to do, and connected to people in their neighborhoods, all those kinds of things. But the fundamental thing that happened is they got out from behind their phones, computers, whatever, and, and they talked to people, as well as, you know, as well as passing the word through social media and whatnot. And so part of what I think has occurred is that because we've got these new wonderful tools, <coughs> we get <coughs> excuse me, a little bit seduced by them. And after a while, we think, you know, well, I've, I've done my duty today. I've signed these four internet petitions or letters to the senator. That's all I have to do. And we forget how to do those other things. And I would argue that if we want to see change, we're going to have to do those other things. You know, we're going to have to actually talk to people who don't necessarily agree with us. You know, actually knock on doors, actually, you know, make phone calls. I mean, all those things. You know, that somebody, I was on BAI this afternoon on a Hugh Hamilton's excellent show, and, uh, you know, somebody called and said, that, well, they're just a foot soldier. I said, hey, foot soldier, you know, in terms of social activism, I said, foot soldier's important. I mean, I remember, you know, for knocking on doors in my state governor's race, I got three voters, you know, nothing from eloquence, just one of them forgot there was the election, and one of them um, didn't know what to do with an absentee ballot, and one of them needed a ride to the polls, just, you know, normal stuff. And 
my governor won in a state of five and a half million by I think it was 139 votes <coughs> after three recounts, you know. And so I accounted for 150th of the margin. <laughs> and there were probably 10,000 volunteers. So, you know, that's, I mean, it was very tangible. You know, had 55 of us stayed home, this horrible right winger would have won. You know, so um, it's, it's a lesson, I think, going forward that we're going to have to do things a little bit differently than we have in this last year, but not in a way that necessarily is different from what we've done at other points in our lives, including, you know, fairly recently, you know, a year and a half ago. But I, I think that's part of the, the, the challenge, but also part of what we have to impart to other people. You know, that that, that work, that's the, the work, it won't happen automatically. And if we think it will, we're just, you know, uh, we're misleading ourselves. But I do think that there are, you know, for all these, the challenges we face, that there are serious opportunities in this current time. And, you know, but it really is us, up, upon us to push ourselves and push them. Let me uh, close with a couple more stories and then open this up to, to, to questions. One is, as we're acting for change, it's important to keep our own spirits up and to not think of this as grim work. Because, well, for two reasons. One is if we do, we're just going to burn out. And two, it hardly makes it attractive to anybody else you know, who we're trying to engage. I mean, if we just, you know, these, these are the people who are just angry and pissed off about everything. Well, not a great image. So I try and learn from others. And I love this story, well, two stories. One is this a friend of mine who died at 102 years old a couple of years ago, named Hazel Wolf. She was this an amazing activist. I mean, she got her start when she was 11. She went to play basketball, and they said, oh, well, everybody knows girls can't play basketball. And she's like, well, I think we can. <laughs> you know, and she's really persistent, like, okay, just go play basketball. Don't bother us. You know, then she becomes a union activist, same kind of persistent. She kept getting these WPA jobs, organizing them, getting fired, and then getting new ones. Um, got involved with the Audubon Society and uh, ended up building some of the first labor environmental coalitions in the country, which are now pretty routine. I mean, it's, you know, that we take for granted that the heads of the major unions and the heads of the major environmental groups meet together. That did not occur 20 years ago. Um, and and that's, a, that's a huge advance, because of, you know, both, to my mind, are, are absolutely necessary. And she, through all that, I would, I would ask her, like, how she kept going. She had this great sense of humor. Um, she was down in C Central America during the Reagan-Bush Wars, and a, a congressman said to her in this kind of condescending tone, she's just sort of short little old lady, oh, I hear you're a bird watcher. Like, oh, isn't that cute? And she said, oh, yes, there's lots of birds in Washington, D.C. that need watching these days. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he did not say very much after that. So that's, you know, that was her spirit, not, you know, not being intimidated. And she, she said, you know, you, you have to draw boundaries. You know, people call you, you know, and you have to say, you know, you're doing great work. That's a wonderful project. But I've got everything I can do on my plate. You know, I, I just, you know, I've got to wish you well on it, but I can't do another thing and keep doing what I do right. She said, you can't do everything, but you can do what you can. Mm -hmm. Then you can do some more, and you can do that your whole life. She also knew how to kind of nurture her spirit. So she said, you know, you go hiking, you go kayaking. She lived in an area of the country where it was, you could do that. She did both into her 90s. And she gets a mischief of a smile, and she says, then you come back ready to take on Exxon. <laughs> you know, and that's, you know, that's part of it, too. So she didn't shy away from a big fight, ever. But she also knew how to refresh her soul. Very, very important. And I, mean, I remember her 100th birthday party. I mean, every single person there had been influenced by her. You know, someone, there are seven, someone, some people, are, there are 65, and he said, yeah, I retired, and she called me up the next week and said, hey, youngster, you're just getting started. I've got a committee for you to be on. So, you know, it didn't matter who it was. And that's one model. The other is, is Desmond Tutu. <coughs> and I thought a lot about Tutu's life, and, you know, I can't imagine anybody taking on more difficult issues in their life. I mean, you know, just starting out, I mean, just being a black man in apartheid era South Africa, you know, and having to tell your kids, oh, you can't go to this beach or park or school or city or, I mean, you know, just tears your, tears your soul apart. And seeing friends in prison for decades or murdered or tortured 
And then he chairs the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So he means you've got months and months of you know, the most horrendous stories of what how the crimes committed under apartheid. And he's the spiritual and, and emotional hub of all of it, holding it all together. And, you know, and it's all resting on him, but you know, that's quite a burden. And you would think that he would just sort of, after all of that, feel like, okay, you know, I've lived, I've done enough, I'm just gonna kind of relax and go to the beach. And yet, what's interesting is he sort of hasn't stopped. And he was in Rwanda trying to bring healing to that scarred land. And he um, was in Haiti and they were trying to steal an election and people were rioting and there were helicopters to fly out the election observers because they were literally risking their lives. And he said, no, I've got to be there with, you know, with my people and, and stayed and kind of redirected the protest to some degree and they, they got the, the government they'd elected. It's an early critic you know, of the Iraq war before and after it began. And recently talking about global climate change, that there's three billion reasons to act on it, the three billion poorest people in the world because they did not create it and they're gonna bear the brunt of it. So always, always talking about you know, hard issues. And yet, I, rather than sort of you would expect him to be, I don't know, seen too much, discouraged, beaten down by the weight of the world, but he's not. I mean, he's so delightful if you ever have a chance to see him. I've seen him three times. He always tells a joke at some point. I mean, he used the, he always used the same phrase. He says, God has a sense of humor. And he joke, I remember it's kind of a silly joke. He said, who would think the world would learn anything from South Africa? We're not the brightest country. Our scientists said that they would build a rocket to the sun. And when people pointed out that it would burn up, they said, no, we'll launch it at night. It'll, it'll be fine. <laughs> and I remember sitting there laughing. And then I'm thinking, but like, you know, he only has 20 minutes and he could tell some more stories about Nelson Mandela and all the things they did. And, you know, why is he telling this silly joke? And then I got it. You know, he's just reminding us to laugh. You know, by the way, he presents himself. And, and it, was, it, was a, it was something to take and, and, and learn from. So that was, that was very important. I mean, just reminding, like Hazel, to, to keep laughing. And then, the other moment was, um, I, it was a benefit, first time I saw him, it was a benefit for South African Project it was in Los Angeles. And he's been battling prostate cancer, and so his health is sort of up and down, and his energy is up and down. And it was sort of low level that evening, he wasn't feeling very well. And he gives this talk, and some other people speak. And then a band starts playing from East Los Angeles, some really nice, great music. And I look, people start dancing, and I look over, and there's Desmond Tutu, and he's just dancing away. And I'm thinking, I've never seen a Nobel Peace Prize winner, much less an archbishop, <laughs> dance before. Very interesting. What's the lesson? The lesson to me is here's somebody grabbing every single moment of what he would call the grace of the world, and just you know, fiercely savoring it. And that feeds that radical passion for justice and strengthens it. And within him, they're inseparable. And, and I, I take that as a model. I mean, you know, wherever we go, I just, that's, that's what we need to be, you know, to learn from that. So why don't I close there and just, you know, thinking about what our task is now, it is to look at the moment we have, build on everything that everybody has won in previous times, including some of the things that we've won not so, not so long ago, and then move forward and say, all right, what really would create a more just world? and then act on it. Thanks. <laughs> Love to take some questions. And that mainstream agenda that's been going through Congress, dealing with global warming, right. has been heavily criticized as grassroots as being Wall Street-centric. Goldman right. Sachs is right. supporting the same right. policy of that. Right. And just to quickly continue, right, right. that's, in the past, that kind of environmentalism it was NAFTA, utility deregulation, and issues that were quite problematic right. in and of themselves disenchanted right. people. Yeah. And also gave Ralph Nader legitimization. Right, for further. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if it gave us, I mean, I, I don't I think it actually gave us NAFTA because most. Pretty well, most of the environmental groups were opposing NAFTA. There were a few that backed it. But. Seven big groups NRDC, EDF, National Wildlife Federation, Audubon. And uh, Conservation National Conservancy, and then one or two other uh, I don't, did, I mean, I'm not sure, I may be wrong. I mean, Sierra Club definitely opposed it. Sierra Club, Greenpeace, uh, Earth Island, 
I thought NRDC opposed. I might be wrong. They but yeah, yeah. I mean, what what I would say is this. I mean, you know, I think for for Christian Coalition to, I mean, I'd like them to work with the Sierra Club, but you know, to to stretch to to National Wildlife Federation. I mean, one of the reasons they did, they said, is they have a lot of hang hunter conservative hunter, hunters and evangelicals in their group, uh, and they can. You know, and that made them comfortable. I actually think, I mean, the current head of it, Larry Schweiger, is really good and really committed. I mean, he basically said, they asked him to return, to come in as, as head, and he said, only if you make climate change an absolute top priority. And, as then that's, a non, you know, and that's a non-negotiable demand. I mean, if you, work, you know, if you don't want to work on that, then, then I'm not interested. So I think that in their particular case, they're now moving pretty strongly on it. In terms of the, you know, the substance of the bills, I mean, I happen to be on the same side of, you know, if I look at my, what the bill that I would like, probably the same side that, that you're on, which is I would rather have something, rather than the sort of complicated cap and trade, I would rather have what they call basically tax and dividend, where they simply levy a carbon, it's what James Hansen of NASA wants, um, I think it's what Greenpeace has been pushing for, we simply levy a carbon tax, and you refund the money right back because that's the only way it's going to be politically palatable. I mean, if it goes into the general government fund, you're never going to get conservative. You know, there's never going to buy into it. I mean, so that would be my preference rather than the much more gameable um, cap and trade where they can offset it with some project that may or may not be, be real or not. Um, I would also say, I mean, I guess to me, though, I would say at, at this point, I would take any bill that sharply ups the cost of carbon that can get through is a good start as far as I'm concerned. But it has to sharply up, up the price of carbon. I mean, because that's what it's going to take to start shifting things towards alternative fuels. And I think in some sense the mechanisms are secondary. Now, I do mistrust the ability of those cap and trades to be gained. I, I think it is a real vulnerability. So I would, put, you know, my preference would be the cap and dividend bill. You know, but if in fact you really could, I mean, and I, was, I was on a plane with a, with a congressman from the North Seattle suburban district named Jay Inslee, who's really been good on climate change. And, and he, I mean, he's just, he's just a gutsy guy. I mean, he, he won by 1% when a libertarian split the vote, and two years later was speaking out against the Iraq war, you know, at the height of Bush's popularity. <laughs> so he's somebody who basically, you know, speaks his mind, whatever the political winds are. And he said, you know, there are actually in that cap and trade bill, he had some misgivings about it, but there was a lot of very good specific things in it that would do a huge amount for alternative energy. And they're sort of in the, you know, the details in the fine print. But again, to me, I would say that whatever, as long as it's sharply, I, I would want li strong limits against gameability, which I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. If, are they in the bill now? Well, I'm not sure. It's kind of right on the edge. Um, but I do think that if we can get something that sharply increases the cost of, of any fossil fuels, that's going to start shifting things in the right direction. And so I would say sort of, you know, whichever of them you can get. And I'm not sure, I mean, the people are saying, oh yeah, this one's much more politically achievable. I'm not clear which one is, you know. And I, I actually suggest to some friends, some people I know in some of the groups, well, let's run with both. See which one, you know, because right now the Republicans have sort of said, oh, well, we don't want this. But, you know, the other one, theoretically, force them, force, call the bluff. You know, run both of them, and I mean, there actually are now. There's my senator Maria Cantwell, together with Susan Collins, has the much more straightforward cap and dividend version that she put forward. It's actually my preferred bill, but it, but whichever one you can get through, if you can get one through, I think it starts some other things happening, and then you got to build on, and then you got to go the same thing. You just got to come, keep right back, and keep the pressure on, and keep and keep up, keep upping it rather than watering it down. I mean, and that's a huge political task. But I mean, I, you know, there, there is no larger issue than climate change. So, so I, I think it's a critical one. Let's see. There, and then there, and then there. I'm trying to um, hop around. You were talking about the, uh, the uh, Tea Party movement. Yeah. And a very, you know, strong, active movement. And why are we not being out the same way? And uh, it seems to me that they are coming from anger and they have a very focused agenda, mm -hmm. which was also true of the great movements that you cite. You know, the That's true. Yeah. 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 
very focused and a lot of anger. Right. We're now in a situation where there are so many issues. Right. Uh, kind of where it began and how do you, you know, we don't, I think we're almost defeated by the sense that there are just so many things. Right. Well, I think, I mean, a couple thoughts. You know, one is, I mean, I, I think anger in the right way can be a good thing. I mean, you know, there thing, you know, we should be angry at the way our economy has been strip mined, you know, and the manufacturing, you know, including NAFTA saliently, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's part of our challenge is to find the, you know, to find the issues where we can, you know, and I actually do think that the sort of the interweave between the economy and climate change is a really good issue to work on because you've got, you have, I mean, given what's going on in the economy now, if you solve it in a way that people feel like is going to make them more vulnerable, you're just going to, all you're going to do is produce backlash. So you've got to, you know, and there's groups like the Apollo Alliance and Blue Green Alliance that are union environment coalitions that really are pushing to use, you know, solving climate change as a way to bring green jobs, you know, back, and you got to do. That's what Van Jones was, you know, promoting, and you, you. And I think that that's the juncture, and you know, and then we've got, you know, then we got a way to use our anger that our economy has been, you know, squandered and you know, speculated away, and that you know we're also destroying the climate. So, so I think the the, the, the juncture of those two is, you know, is probably the way to do it. You know, you know, and one more story about unlikely, well, you know, it's not exactly a coalition, but as, as I said, PowerShift is this huge global climate change student conference that I spoke at. And somebody was telling the story about their uncle, I think it was their uncle, who was like a total Rush Limbaugh ditto head. And, you know, all the way down the line. But walked in one day and said, I just put solar panels on, and I just, you know, I've got a plug for an electric car, and that'll show those SOBs in Saudi Arabia. So, you know, even there, conceivably, there's ways to frame it. Um, yeah, let's see. There and then there. Yeah, I, I love your form debate. Yeah. Um, and thank you. I, I think we can carry it in a similar fashion. Um, Obama and the Democrats basically think the polls and about its support versus its opposition are not moving very quickly right. because it's just so damn complicated. It's going to take a long time for people to just kind of get it. Um, is this one unique? Is this a little bit different because the mechanism for change is so embedded in this industry and these very extremely complex rules that may take people a very long time to understand as the improvements will really matter to them? I, you know, I, I mean, obviously it's more complicated than some issues, but I don't think, I think fundamentally, you know, it's a huge chunk of the economy, but I mean, is it going to be less complicated than, you know, dealing with energy stuff? I mean, I don't know, you know, or, or really trying to create a just economy. I think all these things, the challenge, I mean, I have a whole chapter on stories. And the challenge is you've got to embody this stuff in stories. And you've got to have stories that speak to the heart of it. And if you don't, you lose. Now, of course, the problem is they come in with manufactured stories from the political right that are just, you know, the death panels or whatever. They're simply not true. But, you know, I think, so part of it is challenging when there's false stories, but also, also putting out our own true stories that, that go to the heart of it, you know. And, I mean, it's interesting because Obama, I mean, Obama vacillates so much in terms of which Obama you get on a given day. And, you know, when you get the really good Obama, he is telling those stories, and he's telling them in a way that really does push some good things through. And then other times, no. You know, other times he's trying to please everyone. I mean, I honestly, I mean, I know some, you know, people say, that, well, you know, it's these donors and these corporate interests that are, have them under their sway. That's not, that's actually not my read on. My read is that it's a little bit more characterological of just he, you know, this sort of life as a kind of outsider. He really likes to please everybody. And, you know, it just, in some contexts, that's good, and in some contexts, it just doesn't work. You know, now, that's not true of the whole, you know, I mean, it's not true of, you know, some of the senators, I would say that's not the, you know, Baucus or Lieberman or Conrad or whatever. I mean, I know who they like to please, and I know what they're listening to. Um, but I think in Obama's case, you know, part of it is really saying, look, you really can't do both. And if you want progress, you have to say, this is what I believe, and stand up for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, earlier today, you mm -hmm. were talking about the moral imagination yeah. and about finding um, some good in your enemy. Could you, could you talk a little, a little more about it? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, 
And, and I'm not, when I say that, what I'm not, I'm not suggesting that in any way we weaken our advocacy of what we believe. Um, I'm just saying that sometimes, I mean, not everybody is redeemable. I don't think Dick Cheney is redeemable. You know, I mean, he just isn't. You know, he's vile. I mean, I loved it, you know, um, what was it? Somebody read a, had a song, they said, Satan wears a button saying, what would Cheney do? <laughs> you know, you know, I thought it was a good song, you know. Um, and, but, but I do think that, you know, most of those sort of ordinary grassroots, even on the political right, I mean, they, if I spent my time listening to Glenn Beck and, and Rush Limbaugh, I might believe the same as they did, you know, you know, and so the challenge is to create, you know, is to talk with them. I mean, you know, one of the interesting things of that Massachusetts, I just came from there, Massachusetts defeat, you know, really is a defeat, and you know, uh, I mean, you know, part of it is the woman Martha Coakley ran a horrible campaign. I mean, you know, she gets in and then she takes off a week and a half with four weeks to go, and she not only disses the Boston Red Sox once, she disses them twice. You just can't, you know. So, so I mean, you know, you could say that. But the other thing that was true is that people weren't being reached out to. And they, were, they did a, some follow-up of like union members, a majority of union members voted for Scott Brown. I and mean, the majority of the union members who were contacted voted for Coakley, you know. So that was, you know, that was a divide. The ones who weren't contacted, raw, you know, misplaced anger. The ones who were contacted, you know, sort of rethought things and, yeah, I guess that is the better choice. So, so I think that's part of it. I mean, because, uh, you know, otherwise, I mean, we, I mean, who knows? I mean, you know, new, I wouldn't take the governorship for New York State for granted by any means. You know, not even necessarily the Senate. I mean, and, and what's going to depend on is a bunch of people being contacted, you know, by phone and door to door in, you know, Queens and Staten Island and Brooklyn and, you know, all the rest of the boroughs and, you know, outer areas. And, you know, if enough of that happens, then the results here will probably be pretty decent. But if it doesn't happen, who knows what could occur? Because people get fearful and desperate, as when we saw that in Massachusetts. So I think, you know, so, that, so that's the, you know, it's, it's the sense of, being able to understand that somebody who initially comes off, you know, possibly, you know, on the other side or whatever, that you still got to dialogue with them. You still got to reach out to them. My name is Ariel, and I'm from Canada. And one of the reasons I love to come and I will be around in New York to All Souls is an event like this evening. And I want to thank you very much. And if I can afford it and work it out, I'm going to buy at least three of your books. Oh, great. I like that. I recommend, you know. <laughs> Some very good friends of mine. Oh, good. Uh, this no. is Hanukkah and Christmas come early this year. You know. occasion. I myself have been involved in the work for peace for at least 40 years. And I'm a senior citizen. And so now I spend all the time and all the money that I can manage uh, and all my energies to do the work for peace, because I'm convinced that we've got to have a world in one piece, spelled P-E-A-C-E and P-I-E-C-E. -E. Mm -hmm. I find your statement very inspiring, and I don't want to go on at, a, at length. Yeah, because we do it. That's yeah, right, yeah. because I believe that every single one of us can be an agent of change. And with the Unitarians, and other people will remember this, we have a wonderful hymn based on a poem, and it's called Say not, the struggle does <coughs> not avail us. And the struggle that we're all engaged in is whether there is going to be a future, both for our own children and grandchildren, and for all the children of the earth. <coughs> and I believe and hope that the Unitarians, and others may be here who are not Unitarian, are going to play a critical part. One little thing that I remember is that the Dalai Lama whose spiritual base I visited about a year and a half ago, I picked up some statements from him. And what he said, never give up. Yeah. Never give up. Yeah. No matter what. No, I, I think it's, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, you know, yeah. that that persistence of him, again, it's a model. And again, I mean, it, it's done with, I mean, I, if people have seen him, it's an amazing sense of humor. I remember when he visited Seattle and he gave a scarf to my mayor. 
And he has his hand and he says, with his mischievous grin, he says, it's made in China. And, my, <laughs> and then my neighbor is like, oh shoot, it's like a snake. You know, I'm going to just kidding. So even and if so we that's, die, yeah. even if we die in yeah. the process, yeah, the you program, keep on. Yeah. Yeah. Have, yeah. So, so, yeah, we should go on with some, yeah. Decision, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Isn't it good to hear from the wise women? Yeah. Thank yeah. you for speaking up and yeah. standing up. Yeah. I have to confess, I, uh, I must have come to the wrong lecture because I read the sign on the street. I was walking my dogs and I said, damn, some place to focus my anger, my energy. <laughs> I was charged to come in here. And I appreciate your comments. I really do. It was a good talk. But I thought I was going to get a blueprint. Where do I take like five, what like am three, I going to The seven do? points. Where yeah. are the ramparts and how do we you know, fight for change, because so far, as far as I am concerned, I gave just enough money to the Obama campaign that I was getting high from Joe, high from Michelle, having my emails were so crowded. And when I wrote my intelligent responses to why I was disappointed in actions being taken significantly and most importantly around his promises to end the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, okay? And I made these intelligent comments and I got no response, male or demon. And it wasn't until I said, how do I get off your mailing list? He broke his promises. And I would not vote for him again today. I would not give him the money that I gave him today. And furthermore, I want out of this communication you know, people pleasing, self congratulatory loop, because if Johnson could get us out of Vietnam, I felt <coughs> Mr. Obama could be consistent with his promises. Now, look, yeah, right, I, yeah. I, I, I'm going to be 65 right. this May. So, my history is very tied up in that kind of activism. And right, this I is mine. with great pain that. The Dixie Chicks, or, or Susan Sarandon and her then partner, you know, how smack down people in the public got because the there was such strength on the other side. I, I thank you for reminding us all not to get overwhelmed, but I do find it lonely sitting with my anger in front of a computer. Yeah. Well, I, I, want I mean, to know when we're marching on Washington. Yeah. I, I mean, part of. Part of the, yeah, I mean, part of, yeah, 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 no, I mean, part of, part of the, I mean, I, and you came in slight, I can't remember if you came in right after, right before I, I you know, talked about, but no, 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 none, none needed, but I think, you know, you, a couple of things, one is, you know, when you said, you know, the anger and isolation behind the computer, that is the crux of part of the problem. It really is, you know, and that is, you know, and again, I mean, there are vital tools, but if we don't get out and we don't connect with our fellow human beings and we don't witness in public, I mean, I was, there was a, the DC coal plant that supplies the capital, there was, it was last February, um, who initiated, Bill, yeah, it was Bill McKibben, who initiated, invited the, the major climatologist James Hansen to participate and uh, several thousand of us were shutting down the DC coal plant which they in fact now are converting to natural gas after delaying and delaying and delaying and boom suddenly you know 2,000 people are going to shut it down and and they went along with it so I think that it's going to require lots and lots of this I actually think I mean it's like you know I actually think that on Afghanistan it's sort of what Obama had said during the campaign you know I can't I mean I disagree with it but I can't say it was necessary. It was actually betrayal. It just was, you know, it was just a policy that I knew I was going to have to be pushing back on back then, and know that I'm going to have to be pushing back on now. Uh, you know, and the Iraq is phasing out. But the main, to me, the main point is, you know, that what you're saying is that I completely agree. Is that we've got to find ways to levy the pressure, and that's and that and that's the critical element. I mean, again, as I said earlier, I mean, I don't regret. Uh, you know, I, I put a chunk of my savings into that campaign. I don't regret it at all. But I also don't have any illusions about it being an end point or sufficient. I just think, okay, here we are. It's, you know, we are in a better situation, I, would, I, I think unquestionably, 
I mean, you know, who would the, who would, how long would that court be reprehensible if instead of Sotomayor they'd appointed a, yet another Roberts or Alito? I mean, it's bad enough. It's horrible now. But add some, you know, add another 38-year-old? Ugh. You know, I shudder to think. And then when Stevens goes, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's, you know, you can hold off hope on pressuring, maybe pressuring, uh, what's his name, Kennedy. The rest of them? I mean, not a chance in hell, you know. So, you know, so I think the real challenge is, is to get out from behind the computer. I mean, you know, and find, you know, and find out ways to join with other people and push on the policies, you know, that we believe in. I mean, that's, that's the real crux of it, I think. Let's say go over there and then there and then there, I'm trying to hop around in order that's it, of the hand. I just a little snatch of something on um, Frontline about two years ago. I was wondering if you knew anything further about it. <clears throat> they were doing a program on evangelicals coming over to the environmental movement because they felt yeah. they were stewards yeah. of the earth and they were particularly against uh, mountaintop removal yeah. and all of that stuff. And I haven't heard anything since. Oh, yeah, no, actually, I mean, I, should, yeah, I usually mention I just sort of ran out of, you know, the, there's only so many things I can jam in, but I have a whole section in Soul of a, the new version of Soul of a Citizen on the profile of a guy named Rich Sizek, who was, and, and Sizek was the vice president for governmental affairs of the National Association of Evangelicals. And what that means is they're lobbyists. And what that means is he's lobbying on stuff like abortion and gay marriage on the other side from the side that I'm on. And what happens? He gets converted by a prominent British evangelical who also happens to be a climate scientist. Somehow in Britain they can, somehow can join them and realizes the that you know, climate change has ultimate stakes and becomes enormously involved and does things like taking um, key evangelical leaders like Rick Warren to the Arctic with Harvard climate scientists to witness the melting permafrost and the melting glaciers. And it's huge because, I mean, what he, he said, you know, I mean, basically the argument that was made to him is he said, look, the evangelicals are the, the, the reason the progress is that America is behind in progress, every other country. Not that the other countries are doing what they need to, but you know, they're moving at least. But America is lagging, last, is in part because the Republican Party is just dug in at its heels. And part of that is, you know, he said, you know, is the base of the Republican Party, the real grassroots base are the evangelicals. And if you can move them on this issue, you can then move the Republican Party to a degree and you can actually get something happening. And he used the phrase he said, which is great, he said, it shook my theology to the core, which is, you know, he said it was the comparable to being born again. And it was, it, I mean, it was such a powerful phrase because I thought, well, what would that mean if you call theology our worldview, so, you know, religious or not, for climate change to shake it to the core, which I think is completely appropriate, you know, because it's ultimate stakes. So I, I find it really, I mean, I've come to know him over, I can't remember when I first interviewed him, I think three years ago, but we've, you know, we've been in touch and corresponded, met him a couple times, and, and he's, even though there's areas that I disagree with him, he is a hero of mine because he's gutsy. He finally did get pushed out of his job by the focus. He, well, what happened is basically he was on a Terry Gross show and, and she asked him about gay marriage and she, he said, well, you know, I'm sort of rethinking some of these things and maybe civil unions, you know, are okay. And that, you know, that was just like, okay, oh, you're gone, you know, over the line, you know. You, you know. But, uh, you know, he's gutsy and, 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 and fearless and I just admire that. And I think it really is, you know, um, I mean, I've got, you know, sent a, I'm doing, uh, Huffington Post is having weekly excerpts of, um, of, of Soul of a Citizen. And when I was carving it out, I asked him, I said, you know, do you have any photographs? Because they're running photographs with you know that they kind of exemplify it. And he sent this one. It was a it was a right to life march, and he and this other guy from the evangelical environmental partnership had this huge banner slip saying "Stop mercury poisoning of the unborn," and we're handing out stuff on how basically you know mercury and birth defects and how most of it comes from coal emissions, so you have to stop coal plants. You know, I mean, this is good. This is I mean, you know, agree with this theology or not? This is genuinely radical stuff, and it's important because he's reaching people, you know, way deep, you know, who, who maybe none of us could ever reach. Um, so so I, I find it really, I'm really glad you raised it. I find it really heartening, you know. Yeah. How do we elect politicians who advocate real change as opposed to a political slogan? 
someone such as Dennis Kucinich or Ralph Nader? And is it possible in a two-party system, winner take all, where parties elect mainstream politicians? Well, I think it's hard. I mean, I think it is structured against third parties. I mean, it, you know, if you were living in Germany, you know, Brit, I mean, you know, the this countries that have parliamentary systems, you can, you know, you can basically run third parties and not split the vote. Although, you know, Stephen Harper of Canada got in because the more progressive parties split the vote, and you know, and he's as bad, you know, in his own way, as bad as Bush, just less powerful. Yeah. Um, you know, so so I think part of the problem is, you know, you deal with the hand you're dealt. And the hand we're dealt from 200 and you know something years ago is this system where I mean there has not been a the only way that third parties have succeeded is sometimes they've moved other parties to the left or right or whatever. But there's not been since you know you know 40 years in since the Republicans replaced the Whigs, there's not been a third party that has become you know the, a major party. So I think it's I think it's a serious structural problem. And so what I would argue is basically, I mean, here you do have the working families ballot line, and you don't have that possible in most states. You know, and that's, you know, it's a lever to say, you know, if you don't vote for, you know, we can co-endorse, we can endorse somebody else. You know, it's, it's a way to apply pressure. But I think fundamentally what you've got to do is you've got to go in there and you've got to try and get, you know, run primary challenges. Um, and I mean, I, you know, they, they're running a primary challenge, you know, Arkansas, which is going to be conservative no matter what, and probably Republican, but, you know, Blanche Lincoln's been horrible, you know, and so when a, you know, a pretty progressive lieutenant governor, you know, Bill Halter, announced against her, move on, start raising money, I chipped in 50 bucks, I thought, yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know, you know, probably if he wins, he'll still get taken down by Republican, but at least, you know, at least there's a fighting chance, and she, you know, she and a four or five other senators did so much damage on that health care bill. You know, I mean, they really held, they became the face of it, they held it hostage, they, you know, they stripped out good stuff, added bad stuff, and, you know, and everybody suffered. So I think the challenge, I, th I think what you want to do is to run primary challenges wherever you can and organize, you know, organize enough of a political base that people can say, you know what, we don't like the way you're voting. We're going to run somebody else unless you switch and be credible. You can't do that, you can't do that disorganized. You can only do that if people are organized, and that's what that you know that's what pushes people and allows them you know and allows them to, you know to, to speak out, or forces them to you know or forces them to take better stands. I mean you know it's both. It's allowing them to you know really vote their conscience. It's forcing them to actually do the right thing. Either way, the you know it's the result you want. The other area is the campaign finance, and obviously I mean in New York's a hard state to pass anything, but. If you look, I write about the model that happened in Maine and Arizona and Vermont, where if you put enough $5 contributions in, you actually get public matching funds to run a competitive campaign it's called the Clean Elections Model. It's really good. If we could pass it, it would be huge. It would also go a long, a long way towards undoing some of the damage of that awful Supreme Court decision. What's the president supposed to do with the Republicans who are united in stopping everything? Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. But he has a group of interns that come in every morning, and they bring an agenda from the White House, and they decide what they are going to go over and destroy. Right. Now, how do you talk? How do you do Well, I mean, I think you... I mean, I think what you have to do, I mean, and that is part of, I mean, you know, it is, if we look at the political picture, it is part of the picture, you know, is the, you know, timidity, corporate compromiseness, whatever, if that's, if that's a word, of the Democrats. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the picture. Part of the picture is this group of Republicans that are, you know, they're not like Jake Javits Republicans or Everett Dirksen Republicans or, you know, whoever. I mean, not to romanticize those people or even Gerald Ford Republicans. I mean, those people certainly had their flaws, but they were at some points willing to do decent things on, you know, significant legislation. And that was good. And these people are not. No, I mean, their strategy is take it all down. And so the challenge is to name them as such, to say that their basics, their solution 
to America's problems is, and you know, is the ultimately cynical solution of stopping everything. You know, of stopping anything being done because they think if they stop enough things being done, they'll, they'll have political gain. You know, and you just got to name them. And you got to, again, reach out to people and say, you know, do you realize this is what they're doing? They do not have any solutions. They're not interested in solutions. And, and you got to be really clear on that. You know, I, and the Democrats need to be clear on that too, but we also do. You know, because they, I mean, they are a, an entirely destructive force at this point. Which is too bad. I mean, we used to have, there's a guy in my state of Washington, I mean, granted, somewhat atypical named Dan Evans, who was a Republican governor and briefly a senator. I mean, he was, came out against the war early on in Viet, during Vietnam, pushed for, unsuccessfully, but almost got a state income tax because we don't have one, pushed for mass transit. I mean, you know, there's some other areas I wouldn't have stands to but you know, there's some really important areas where he was great. They don't have people like that anymore, like that. And that has to be clear. And you know, the other thing that I think has to be clear is that anybody who is a Republican official who does not condemn the just outright lies, the birther stuff in particular, and the, he's really a Muslim. I mean, 45% of Republicans, this is a Harris poll from last week, think that Obama is not qualified to be president because he was born in another country. And something is either 56 or 7% think he's a Muslim. And if in fact, you had Republican officials saying that is not, we don't agree with them, but that's not true. That was imp that's important. They, they won't. They're too cynical. They'd rather ride, it, ride that anger. So I think we have every right to say, you, have, you cannot call yourself a moderate if you're embracing outright lies. You can't. You know, and, and by silence, you're embracing outright lies. Yeah. Do you think political activism should be encouraged irrespective of the political viewpoint of the participants? Right. Because it enhances the political discourse. Because when I look, compared with when I was a student, I don't think that the level of political activism among students these days is anywhere near the level it was when I was a student. Mm. And if two students came up to you and said they were going to join the Tea Party, what would your reaction be to that? Well, complicated. I mean, it, it is, how to describe it? I think that encouraging students, I mean, a lot of what I do actually is on campus. And I work with a lot of campus organizations, you know, sort of national <coughs> higher ed organizations. And you've got to encourage people to participate. Whichever, I mean, if you're going to encourage participation in general, particularly if you're an educational institution, you've got to encourage everybody. And, you know, that's when I ran this election project, we were nonpartisan, and it's like, yeah, if young, you know, you can't give something to a project the campus Young Democrats was during 08 if the young Republicans aren't involved. You just can't do that. So, so I think encouraging in general is good. I do think that there's every right to, to encourage critical reflection and say, okay, well, what are you actually doing and why and having a dialogue about that? You know, and do you actually believe it? But I really can't. I mean, I sort of can't say, oh, it's okay for my side, but it's not okay for their side. I just don't think that's a tenable position. I mean, in fact, during this project, I, one of the first, I have this big email list, which I, if you didn't get it, when it circulated, get it over there. And when, the, when I sent out word about this election project that I was doing, one of the first responses was the service learning director at this very conservative college in Seattle, it's a, a Dutch reformed, free Methodist, evangelical college. And she said, oh, this is great. I'd love to get your materials. And I know that most, I mean, that election, it wasn't as bad as it usually is, but still probably the bulk of their students are going to vote Republican. And my governor was running against, against the candidate that she defeated by 139 votes. And I thought, you know, oh dear, well, what if her, you know, what if, you know, by her getting them involved, I then get this right wing crazy in office. And then I thought, but yeah, that's the rules of the game. If you know, if you make it available to one, you got to make it available to all. And I sent her the materials, and you know, what she did, what she did with them. So, so I, th I think you have to. I think you can do both. You know, and part of it just depends on the role that you're in. In some roles, it's appropriate to encourage people across the board, and in some other roles, you want to advocate for what you believe. And I, I actually do think you can do both, because because I'm often going back and forth. I mean, when I do a workshop on the campuses with faculty and staff and administrators, which I do very frequently, I'm talking about how to get everybody involved. But I'm also talking about, you know, these are the issues and, you know, here's, you know, here's what I believe on them. So I think you can do both. Why don't I talk informally back there? <laughs> <laughs>